Hey guys, I'm going to show you how to um, use different photographs to combine into a concept image, um, sometimes called photo bashing or just one of the many ways that you can do um, concept art in a very, very quick, uh, low impact kind of way. Uh, I've got Photoshop open here as well as a folder full of images, but I wanted to start with showing how to get high quality images and what you should be looking for. So our end result is going to be something like a castle in a forest on a little mountain peak. And I've got a few images here that are going to help support that. But here is a um, standard image search from Google where I've just typed in the word castle and left everything alone. The first thing you need to be aware of is that you need to find references for your end result just to give you information. So if you just open up a few images and take a look, we can see how trees overlap the castle form, uh, generally how the shadow is cast on the side of the object. We can look around and find the differing effects of weather and the angle of the sun and maybe even what happens when we have a reflection in water. So that's just informational stuff and you can kind of just explore initially and find what are all the options that you could be looking at. Um, should we be very up close to the castle? Should we be looking from a low to high perspective or a high to low perspective? Should you integrate weather? Um, that sort of thing. When you're actually looking for the assets that you're going to use in your project, you need to mess with the settings up at the top of the search in order to get only high resolution images and sometimes you need to worry about whether or not it's a copyrighted image. So if we click the tools button here we've got a few different tabs. The size is the first that you should mess with. Um, I would just recommend set that to large and then don't worry about how big these are, they're going to be plenty large. Uh, if we just click on one, I have a little overlay here in the preview that says this is 1100 pixels by 825, which is decent enough. Um, this would be 14 by 8. This one is 3700 by 2800, so that one's significantly larger. So you want to keep track of that because if you have uh, many more pixels to work with, then you can shrink something, you can use smaller portions of the image if you need to. And if you have a particularly small image, it's going to appear blurry um, and distorted when you use it in your project. If you are just using it for basic kind of dropping in of shapes and combining them together quickly and you're planning to paint over the top of them, this is not really such a big deal. But if you'd like to do some photo manipulation and make it look particularly realistic, this can be a much bigger problem. So be careful about the size and typically I'll just set that to large and forget about it. Um, we've got types and color. Color is most important if you are trying to match something more graphical, although the transparent setting can give you uh, images that have a transparent background which can be useful for other purposes. Um, type, you could ask for clip art, line drawings, or um, animated GIFs. I'm just going to leave it on any type so that I get photographs in here. There's a time reference, not really useful for us, but we do have usage rights. So if you are doing concept art which is entirely for your own purposes, let's say this could be internal development at a studio that you're not going to publish, um, this could be a project for school or something like that, then you don't really have to worry about usage too much because you're not selling it, you're not representing it as your own uh, intellectual property, then you're basically going to be fine, although technically speaking you sh still shouldn't do that because um, you're violating someone else's copyright if you are doing that completely alone however and you're not going to publish it then there's very minimal chance of you getting in trouble for that uh, so if you want to respect that then we can do a creative commons license or commercial licenses and plan to pay for the asset but if i click this then it will change the subset of images so that now we've got creative commons licenses which means basically they're okay to share and publish although sometimes they are licensable instead and so you can see as i mouse over these it's sort of telling me in that little pop-up what the situation is and if I click through and go to their site then I can find out if these are um, for pay or if they are just free to use so these are uh, we want to ideally find royalty free images typically um, but if like I said if you're just going to use it for your own development purposes you don't have to worry about that necessarily let's do commercial and other just to see if I can find one that has a different label they all say licensable and I'm not seeing any different label on there so I'm not sure if that's just a generic 
way that they're listing all of these images but you should see royalty free occasionally where it's just public domain uh, anyway for our purposes and especially for classwork you can just set this to all and not really worry about it but remember do not represent these as your original intellectual property um, without significant editing at least I think there's a percentage and I forget what it is so I'm not going to attempt to say what the percentage is that you can change something and that it is counted as free use at that point but I don't know what it is so just so long as you're not trying to publishly uh, or publish or publicly sell um, things that you put together with these images you're going to be fine and typically this kind of concept art is early stage development meaning that we use it to inspire the actual work that we're about to do and the work that we do is entirely our own and so we're free to publish it okay so downloading these images um, is your first big step and I've got a folder full of them here let me just quickly pop through them to show you uh, what I've got this was just a tiny little reference of a castle um, that I thought might be useful for the lower wall. Um, I've got one of reflection on water just to see that pattern because I thought maybe I would include that. This is the background I'm going to use of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, this was off of Getty Images as you can see up here and it was very large so this is going to serve as a nice background. I like the lighting direction. We've got a sort of sunset or sunrise lighting coming from the left of the screen and it's casting shadows to the right so I wanted to be aware that all of my references should be doing that and it's okay if they're flipped the wrong way because we can just do that um, we can just flip the image in Photoshop to correct that so we've got a pretty ornate castle on a sort of outcropping with trees here I've got a close-up of a castle with some ivy or foliage uh, growing on the side of it which I thought would be a nice reference if I got a large picture of grass or an ivy wall then I could mask out certain portions to make ivy grow up the side of any castle that I want uh, this will be the one that I'll be using for um, the primary castle shape. Uh, I like the fact that we had some nice yellowish light coming from the left hand side. Um, pretty well lit. It was a high resolution image and we're on a small stony outcropping which is going to be nice to combine with uh, another of my references. Let's see this one. Uh, I'm going to be placing that castle on top of this and placing this inside of the forest that we saw from earlier. Uh, I did want to point out I have two of this same castle to show the differing effects of having strong lighting versus weak lighting. Um, the strong lighting is good only if you want exactly this lighting setup. The weak lighting is good if you want any kind of lighting setup because we could paint the light directly over this castle ourselves. Um, that tends to be the preferable one. Uh, you want pictures taken on overcast days or a sort of generic lighting where we can't see necessarily where the shadows are being cast or the shadows are so soft that we can't identify them because you have maximum flexibility in that case. You can see that the tones are overall a lot darker and more subdued. We can pump that up with some uh, adjustment layers if we really wanted to, but typically we'd be going for something like this. In this particular case though, I'm just going to use this one that's already lit because it's perfect for our uses. Uh, here I have another that I was initially going to use, sort of an overcast day, although we can see a little bit of light on the left hand side. This one would work perfectly as well, even though it's flipped in lighting direction. I would just flip the image and then uh, mask out everything. Uh, also we've got some watermarks on these images. Since we're doing concept and we could just paint right over this anyway, don't worry about watermarks, don't let that stop you. Um, necessarily because we don't need this to be a perfect piece of illustration or a painting um, and if we were going to take it that far then we would just paint directly over it anyway and try to get these references completely removed before we called it our own work. Uh, here was a small little stone staircase I found which I thought would be useful. Uh, it turned out to be better to just use a picture that had a little bit of an entryway already although I might end up removing that but I thought it would be a nice inclusion. One of the reasons that this didn't end up working is because the angle is wrong. We are looking up at this stone uh, staircase as you can see and the castle we're looking over or across and slightly down towards the bottom and for the forest we're definitely looking down okay so be aware of the angle that you pick your references from also there are sometimes things that we can do to correct the angle just a little bit for instance this one we could probably skew because it's kind of a box shape into looking like we are um, higher up or slightly lower down but that ends up being highly distorting if you do it too much and so you don't want to rely on that and then finally my stone image here where 
we're looking at almost the same angle as that forest down. The lighting is in the opposite direction, but I'll just flip that to correct it. And then we'll only have to worry about color correction, etc. Okay. So those are the references that I've got. So I'm going to start sticking them into a new file and I'm going to begin by dragging in my largest uh, file, which is the background, so that we start exactly the same size as our background image. So that's a nice way to make a new file, although you're at the mercy of whoever made this original. So let's see what the canvas size is. So we're 3,456 pixels by 2,592. I could end up shrinking this image at the end just a little bit uh, if I wanted to, but we don't want to go any larger than that. Okay, so remember that if I just go ahead and zoom in on this, we start to see image degradation pretty quickly. And if I zoom very far in, we can see quite a lot of image degradation. So we want to have the largest images as possible to start off with and then shrink them down from there if need be. So I'm going to put my other images in here. Let's grab the mountain image and you can see by comparison this one is very small. I'm actually going to have to make this one larger to use which is going to cause it to be blurry. So that's going to be a downside of using this one but it was just perfect so I wanted to use it anyway. And here's the castle that I'm going to use and I think that's all. Yeah those are all the references. Alright so let's start to just arrange these and you can see that when I place these into the file the background which I used to make this essentially just opened this file natively. So we've got this PNG open right now and so the background is not locked and it doesn't have this little icon. That icon rec represents a smart object in Photoshop. So a smart object is a reference to the original file which says I'm going to allow you to place this in the file, you can scale it, move it, and run filters over it, but you can't edit directly onto it. So I've got a airbrush right here and if I try to draw it says no the smart object must be rasterized before proceeding okay so I can't paint directly on this but I can do everything else I can use it as a clipping mask I can mask it uh, in its layer directly I can apply layer styles over the top anything except for alter the pixels this is oftentimes fine uh, because we can do lots of non-destructive editing this way but if you end up needing to, for some reason, paint directly on that layer, then you can just right click the layer and we can choose rasterize layer and then it just becomes native pixels. But I'll encourage you not to do that and instead if you want to paint over this, just make a new blank layer on top and then you could paint whatever you want over the top of it just like that. If you need to move them around uh, together, then you can just group them, just put them together like this. And if you collapse that group, then your group stack is or your layer stack is very neat and tidy and now we can just move these two as if I had painted on that layer anyway. So there aren't a whole lot of reasons why you would really need to um, rasterize these layers most of the time unless you're going to be doing like a lot of cutting and pasting of little parts of it in the case of a texture. So try to leave them as a smart object if you can help it. So let's start by um, expanding this out. I'm just using the transform tool um, and constraining my proportions by holding shift and I'm going to want to flip this so if we go to edit transform flip horizontal that will allow us to position it so that it's facing uh, with the light on the left and the shadow on the right when I'm first placing an image in a scene like this I like to turn down the opacity a bit so I can kind of see an overlay of where it's about to go let's just apply that uh, so now I can move it around the scene and choose a location and I think that this slope right here is probably a good enough spot and I could put this little berm over this raised portion of forest right here just so that I've got the appearance of some continuity between this object and the background. Something like this looks about right to me. I've got enough headspace to include the castle over top. Let's turn the castle on. Okay, And I'll do the same thing. I'm going to turn down the opacity just a bit. <clears throat> place it in the scene. It looks like if I wanted my castle to be this big it runs out the top of the screen. Uh, so maybe I'll pick a lower position for this but then we're going to start to change the perspective of the scene a little bit too much. Actually I think that's fine. We can place that right there and let's put the castle in. And I do think the castle needs to be a bit smaller. I'm going to shrink just a bit 
and we only need it to vaguely line up. We don't need it to perfectly line up uh, because these elements are going to be edited by us. We could end up painting over the top of them if we want to. So ignoring this back portion, I'm just looking at the castle part that is planted inside of the rock and trying to see. So it looks like I've got a little bit more space over here than I've provided. So I could either copy and paste some rock details or I could shrink this a little bit more. Let's go ahead and just shrink it a little bit more and see if just about just about here will be fine. I'm going to sink that a little bit lower so I can use more of the original stone. And I think that's going to do it for us. Actually, the perspective is a little bad. I want to raise this back up. Hit enter before I can select a different layer. Let's see. So I'm looking at this top tower and the fact that we're looking up at it and our eye level in this image appears to be somewhere around here and so I don't want to go um, too low down in the screen. This position looks a bit better. I'm not really uh, creating very much continuity between the background and the hill but that's not really strictly speaking necessary anyway. So I could have this hill going in front of the rock to kind of trim off the bottom portion of it. Let's turn the opacity down. And yeah, I think that'll, that'll be okay. We can do something like that. So I'm going to turn both of them on, grab them both at once, move them around the scene just to see where's a nice position. So I could go a little bit further down in the valley, uh, or I could shrink the entire assembly just a little bit, which is probably better for that hill because it did start very small. Put it something like this, and we're getting it kind of towering up into the air. I'm going to use this position. I think that's going to be about fine. So now I'm going to turn the opacity up just a bit on both of them, but not all the way because I do want to still be able to see through. And I'm going to start to mask each one, but first I'm going to save. So I want to save as a Photoshop document, and I'm going to just give it a name of Castle Test. And we want to save a Photoshop document so that all of our layers, blending, um, our masking is all saved. We don't want to continually just work on this PNG because that is very dangerous. Uh, we might lose all of our progress. Even if you get an autosave, it would be a flat file at that point. So we don't want to risk that. All right, so I'm going to start with the mountain and I want to add a layer mask to this so I can trim out all of this background because I don't want to use any of this background. I just want to use the rock. Uh, down in the layers palette, we have a button for that right here, Add Layer Mask, and it creates this little linked square. So what this square represents is the visible area of our uh, layer. White is visible, black is invisible. So if I paint, I've got my uh, airbrush, if I paint black, you can see it makes that portion of the image disappear. But if I disable this, those pixels are still unaffected. So we can enable it or disable it. We can also click this link to unbound the um, mask from the layer. If I do that, depending on which part I've selected, I can either move the mask around like this, or I can move the layer around and leave the mask still. Sometimes this is useful. Uh, a lot of the time, it's just going to be a more advantageous to leave it linked. If you leave it linked, it doesn't matter which one you've selected, they will both move together. Okay, But since we've got static elements, I'm just going to leave that linked and paint on the mask layer. All right, so I do have a very soft brush right now. And if I were to just kind of trace out this mountain like that, it's going to look pretty vague and bad. Uh, it's just kind of floating in this kind of cloudy space in the middle of that hillside. So usually a very soft brush like this is not going to be a very good idea for masking, at least initially. Let me go all the way back. There we go. We should either use a hard brush or we should start using some of our marquee selection tools such as this freeform tool or even the polygon lasso tool if you've got really sharp elements that you want to respect. Uh, I'm going to go for the lasso tool and zoom in. And so what I'm doing, I, right now I've got a mask where everything is visible. So I want to select the outside portions like that and fill them with black so that they disappear. So I'm going to trace out the contour of this and you don't have to be especially careful because we can always just paint little bits back in. 
but getting more complicated shapes like that is going to be helpful because then it's going to look a little bit more realistic as if this really was sitting in the scene. You can see I've got little bits of sky included. If I want to repair that, I can use with a clipping mask on top of it uh, a layer and just paint in some of those colors. Or I can come back in after the initial selection and just try again. Do a slightly more careful selection like that. And if we want to add parts back in, say I accidentally remove a piece of the mountain like this. Whoops. And I can just make a selection like this and fill it with white. Okay, The way I'm deleting and filling right now, I have black and white selected as my colors. If I make a region selection and I have black as my foreground color, I can hit Alt Backspace and it will just fill that area with my uh, foreground color. And if I just hit Backspace, then it will fill it with my background color. So that's white that it just got filled with and alt backspace and it's filling it with black. So that allows you to very quickly go around the image and do your editing. Uh, be careful if you are working right next to the edge of the thing that you're trimming out. Sometimes I see students do something like this where they grab a little bit of this, get rid of it, and then they forget about the, the further portions of the sky because maybe it's blending in or they just too far um, zoomed into the image to notice. Um, typically, you're going to want to go all the way outside of the edges of the original image to mask. Don't try to trace carefully the edge of the image because you might miss a little portion of it. There's really no point to that. Just go generously outside the edges, grab and fill. Okay. So oftentimes I may do that first. We'll go all the way outside very, very far and trim in little bit by little bit. So I'm tracing out some of the trees here just because they're nearby this rock surface and I think they might be useful. And if they end up not being, then we can always just remove them. And for the bottom portion here, I'm not quite sure yet how it's going to sit into the scene. But since that's more detail work, let's leave that for the moment. I've got this nice cut out of this rock. It looks very out of place at the moment, but that's okay. We're going to adjust all of that stuff. But since I'm going to need this to integrate into the forest down here, I may have to do much more complicated masking to carefully um, trace out the position of trees so that it overlaps this. But let's leave that for a second step. All right, here's the castle. And we're also going to add a layer mask for that. And we're also going to trace it out. So I'm just going to do a big rough shape first like this and remember that I've got to come all the way back here because that's the shape that I'm cutting out so that I can fill it with black and so I've traced out all of the sky except for the rough outline of the castle and now I'm going to come in closer and try to do as detailed a job as I need to. I don't know how much of this rock down here that I'm going to keep so just for the sake of argument I'm going to try to trace up the side of that rock carefully and Oops, I hit the wrong, there we go. And I'm not sure if I got everything there. It looked like I maybe missed a little part. When you get to architectural elements like this that have nice straight lines, you may not want to use um, this freeform tool. If you click and hold, we can get the polygonal lasso tool instead. The difference between the two is whereas the first one, I was just clicking and dragging all over the screen. This one requires just a click, move, click, move, and you can get nice straight shapes with it. Sometimes I like to use this one even on curved uh, shapes because if you are very careful and just click frequently you can get very carefully shaped curves as well or at least what appears to be like a curve but with architecture this tends to be a lot more helpful because you can just click on your starting point and then find the next point in a straight line and like I said we're just kind of doing a general placement of this castle so it doesn't have to be absolutely pixel perfect. So I'm just tracing up this kind of staircase shape. This little, I don't know what that is, it's not quite a weather vane, but that little object I'm going to need to do separately. Also, I will frequently do this, so this is an important thing to point out. I'm not trying to outline the entire thing all at once because a misclick can be extremely annoying with this. Okay, So imagine that you're going along some complicated shape and at some point you double click. That's what happens. It ends the selection 
and draws a line to your starting point. If you did that halfway through this castle, so boop, 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 we're going along, and I get all the way over here, and I double click, then I get this awkward shape, and I have to figure out how to salvage this somehow, which is extremely obnoxious. Okay, Not to mention that you've got to move your view along as you're using this tool, which can sometimes create misclicks. Instead, do one small pocket at a time. So first I did this portion and then drew outward, encircled the sky shape, and then deleted. And now I'm starting a new selection. And I'm going to start right where I left off like that, but drawing from out here so that that's my ending point. And then I'm going to carefully see if I can remove this little shape. We'll ignore that spike. We don't really need that. I'm going to go up this bell tower and usually any point where I'm about to turn around some corner or down a new shape, I'll just at that point stop my selection, delete, and start a new one. I don't want to go down the opposite side of this because then if I mess up it's going to cut straight through that object. But if I mess up over here it's really not a big deal. It's just going to prematurely cut this shape off into the sky and I'll still be able to continue working without using an undo. So I'm going to go down this side. I just realized I'm violating my own rule immediately after saying it, which is funny, but it's okay. I only just started this one. Oh, there we go. See? Now I'm paying for it. That's the problem. Okay? So I really should pay attention to my own rules, right? Let's go up and down this spike. And then we'll come out here. And now I can start on the opposite side. I can start out here and not have to worry about cutting straight through an object if I accidentally double click. Okay. You can do this step with either a um, tablet pen or a mouse, it doesn't really matter, whatever you're most comfortable with selecting accurately. Uh, if you find that a mouse is easier then that makes sense to me, that's fine. But just do whatever makes you comfortable on this one. Uh, okay, so I'm going to cut off this shape. There's a little triangle there that's left over that I noticed. Try to pay attention to that stuff because it might be a little blemish on your final image if you don't catch it now. You may also see that there's a small blue kind of halo. Mm, I guess we can't see it. If I put a solid layer behind it, there's a small blue kind of halo on some of this architecture um, because the sky color is kind of bleeding into the image. Also, there are interior features like the interior of that bell tower that I might want to remove so that whatever is behind us, if it's like forest or something, then we'll see the forest through there. But it's getting so picky down in these tiny little sizes that it may not be visible at all. So I'm just going to go ahead and do some of these little bits, but I'll just leave it at that. And if we end up having a problem, then I'll know I need to go in and remove some extra little parts here. All right. So here we go. I've got this corner. Let's go across the top here. You can always uh, select, deselect if you want to start inside of your current selection. I think the, what's the keyboard shortcut for that? Deselect, um, control D if you wanted to. I often just click somewhere else though. A lot of production art, concept art, is sort of about finding a fast way to work rather than a perfect way to work. I like to minimize going into menus. I like to minimize clicks. Um, I like to do things that allow me to uh, complete the operation that I'm doing in one or two steps rather than several. And that's just because if you're going to do this a few dozen times in a day or maybe a few hundred times, um, those extra steps will bog you down and eventually make it uh, much harder to get your job done. And that's going to cost you money if you're working on contract, or it's just going to make you less desirable uh, compared to your coworkers if you take twice as long to do something that they can do in half the time. So efficiency and cutting corners is not always a bad thing, especially if perfection is not the goal. And really with concept art, perfection should not be the goal. Your goal is to just get a basic image so that you can inspire the production artists and they can start doing the actual work that's going to be included in the game or the animation. That said, we should be able to do things at a very high degree of quality, just not always making that our singular goal. Okay. Uh, oh, I think I just started outlining something I'm not going to include there. Yeah, that 
turret, right, I'm not going to use. So I'm just going to cut down. I'm trying to see around my hand. Let's say right here. I think it comes down here. And then I don't really know, but I'm just going to go straight down. And at this point, it just kind of disappears. All right, let me take a step back, see how that looks. Okay, I think that's about right. So we've got this little bit of rock and a castle in the middle of this forested area. I don't really need the entire forested area, so one thing I could do to chop this down is I could trim the background to a smaller size, but I'll just go ahead and leave it for now. I'm gonna save. You always wanna save between major steps, and then I'm also gonna turn the opacity back up to 100% for both of these so that I can start doing color correction and more careful masking. All right. So first thing, we need these to blend into the background better. Right now they are sticking out very, very badly. And since they are smart objects, we don't want to um, do adjustments such as an adjustment layer right on top of them. That would actually give us a smart filter, but that's okay. Um, we're going to use some of these uh, adjustments, right? Adjustment layers themselves. And there's two that I like to use pretty frequently. One of them is color balance and the other is curves. So color balance is for shifting the colors towards the hues that you see in the scene. Curves is about how light and dark things are. And so oftentimes those two things will be the most different. Um, so they are the things that you have to adjust. But there's a problem with this. Let's do uh, color balance. So here's a layer. <clears throat> Looks like a little, um, I don't know, a level or a weight. Uh, measurement sort of thing and this is the mask for that layer and that names it appropriately so if I start sliding these things I've got three settings shadows midtones and highlights what I see is this island is too green maybe a little bit too blue compared to my background so I'm gonna to shift towards red the entire image is shifting towards red and that's not what we want if I make this a clipping mask though so create clipping mask now it will only affect this layer, okay? And that's really what we want. So now I can freely adjust this and not change my original and so we can make them match. So I think the midtones do need to be a bit more red, but we're gonna have to change all three of the shadows. If I can look at the shadow parts of this background, more blue seems wrong. Let's see, more cyan seems a bit better. They won't always all three of them be the same direction. In fact, if you do that, you'll just get a monotone color like this. And so you should avoid doing that and try to only make careful adjustments. If you can't see a difference, leave it alone. Let's try highlights as well. I think the highlights will go towards yellowish, reddish, so we get more of an orange. Sometimes I like to push it very far so that I can bring it back and check. I think it's going to be something more like that. Is that a little bit more red? Now about this last one. Tiny bit of magenta, but I'm going to tone it all down. You can also do this. You can push them really far like that and you could turn down the opacity of the adjustment itself. So if you're trying to make bold decisions and then tone it back down so that it blends with the original a little bit, that's one way that you can use these. I don't recommend oftentimes doing that. Instead you should just make good adjustments in the first place. But it is a way that you could work if you wanted to. Okay, so something in this region. The great thing about adjustment layers though is that I can always come back and I can change these again. So that's close enough for the moment. Uh, I'm going to do the curves portion of this. And then once I do that, I might see a new adjustment that I wanna do with the colors, okay? So we're gonna add another adjustment layer, curves. And you can see that curves is not right now a uh, clipping mask, so it will darken and lighten everything. 
So I want to make it a clipping mask. So how curves work is that this is a chart showing uh, light and dark input and output in the scene. Over on the left is the blackest colors. Over on the right are the whitest colors. And if I click and drag within this chart, I can change the output of the, the colors. So if I grab this far right hand point, I'm taking everything that was white in the scene and making it output as a darker color, right? If I do the opposite and I drag it this way, I'm taking things that were gray in the, the scene and I'm making them output as white. So this is the output and this is the input on the right hand side. So typically for a more subtle adjustment, you just want to click in the middle of this uh, line somewhere and either arc it downward or arc it upward. Um, respectively, this makes it um, overexposed or underexposed just a little bit, but it can drastically change the feeling of the asset like this. And sometimes you may need a few more offsets. So what I don't like here, let me just drag that off to get rid of it, is that this appears too bright in the scene. Okay, so I wanna darken the lightest bits just a little like that. That though also darkens the darker portions of this. So I'm gonna click over here and drag it up just a little. So now I've got lighter dark colors and darker light colors. And so we're getting sort of this averaging effect. If I do this too much, it looks like this gross kind of gray sort of thing. So you wanna be very subtle with this and double check by putting it back in the center and dragging it down and up a little bit to see if that was the kind of adjustment you wanted. So I want just a little bit lighter in the dark colors. I'm gonna bring this down significantly further. Okay, and darken it just a bit like that. You can see that the line continues off for some time in the direction that it was traveling. So you may need a few points to do this. I wouldn't recommend too many though, because uh, you don't wanna overcomplicate this graph. You can also see the difference before and after by clicking the uh, visibility toggle. So you can see my adjustment is very, very subtle here but it gives it a slightly better contrast, I think. I maybe didn't do quite enough. Let's see, I'm gonna get rid of one of these. Oh, it's off, no wonder I can't see. Okay, so I just wanna darken some of the lightest bits. I'm gonna get a dot to stay right here on the line for me. Yeah, so I'm just gonna bring that down a little bit way up here. And then down here on this side, just a little bit up. Yeah, I'm gonna slide this down a bit more. Let's get two on the line. You can put two like this so you can have an area that's unaffected. Now this part, there we go. That's the shadow area that I really wanted to affect, just that part over there, just to bring it up a little bit. Okay, so something like this seems all right to me. And I don't have to pay any attention to this grass because that's not a part of the scene um, that I care about. Try one more time there. It still seems a bit bright on those rocky parts, but uh, maybe a color wash or something over the top of that will help as well. Okay, so there's two adjustment layers at least that are helping to blend us into the scene. Let's also try to get better masking and maybe a little bit of painting over the top to complete this effect. So for that, we're gonna create a new blank layer as a part of the clipping mask. And I can put this, I can put this right at the top of this stack. And this would be extra colors that I would paint right over the edges just to blend it in nicely. And then I'm gonna to return to the mask itself and let's get a, um, a sharper brush with black. Yeah, I'm painting with black. Close this so I can see. And on this edge, I'm just gonna paint sharper, more jagged edges to try to remove some of the sky that we had seen before. And the top part, I'm not gonna do very much to because we're gonna place something over the top of that anyway. Let's lop off this little bottom bit as well. Okay, so something like that. And now I'm going to use my airbrush to see where should I blend this in with the background. So here's this line of trees coming down here. And there are a few trees that look like they could 
start to interpose over the top of this and feel like this is grounded uh, within the scene. So like right here, and I'm drawing with a very, very low opacity on this mask so I can see trees behind this. So there's a few trees right here that I kind of want to pick out and say that they should be over top of my rocky image. Um, this one for sure. Let's see what else. Um, let's get a few of them. Go significantly higher into this area. Get some here, here, maybe this. Okay, let's see how that looks. I'm going to turn this back up. You can see there's places where I've chopped out bits, but not everywhere. So anywhere underneath those trees that I chose, I'm just going to get rid of that whole area. And so little by little, it will feel like the trees are covering over this. And we're seeing something that's actually in the landscape. OK, so a little bit better. I do have an airbrush chosen right now. Let's get rid of that. that. And so it's a little bit blurry and indistinct looking. And I could fix that by um, choosing a sharper brush to do these adjustments. I don't really like that sticking out. There we go. So we can make it feel like it's poking out from the top of a tree there. Uh, OK, so then I'm going to get my sharper brush to do a better job of this. My sharper brush is not like razor sharp or anything, but it's just going to give the trees here a slightly more distinct feeling. Doing custom brushes for this sort of thing would be the very, very good thing to do. Um, but we haven't covered that yet in curriculum, so I'm not going to show um, myself using that to fix these problems just yet. Just know that you could just kind of shrink this way down and scribble over the edge if you wanted them to be very, very uh, distinct looking or just use a slightly soft brush. So I'm finding this one's a little bit too hard, so I'm going to soften it just a little bit. And we could always flip the color that I'm masking with and take away from these shapes as well if we wanted to, if I end up going too far. Like that. I'm going to flip it again, go back to hard brush, and I'll just do little circles, kind of like mimic the shape of the foliage a little bit. Keep it more randomized. Any sharp edges are going to be very easy to spot, uh, but on the architecture, sharp edges are what you want, at least mostly sharp. Okay, I'm going to make it bigger. We can have it a little bit softer to kind of match the lower resolution of the object behind it. Okay, something like that. So this is only going to do part of it, though. You're going to see that it still looks a bit odd. It's not really blending in very, very nicely because we've got more work yet to do. Okay, So part of that is why I have this layer up here. Okay, This layer up here can help me to paint shadows directly onto this form. So for instance, we've got trees here and this grassy landscape, and you can see the shadow being cast from those trees. Well, that means these trees should cast a shadow as well. So I'm going to sample the color in the shadow as best I can, and then sort of fill in these shadow shapes, just kind of vaguely like this. And these are full opacity colors right now. As soon as I do just a few, I'm going to turn down the opacity and change this to maybe a multiply or something. Okay, something like that. And so we could do some of that over here. Actually, let me grab the darker colors over here. There we go. Okay. Do a little bit more masking. Maybe that's too far. And we want to zoom out occasionally to check the progress here. So now we've got this much more natural looking transition from front to back. And the shadow layer has helped significantly to make them feel like they belong together. Um, we can also do this for the forest background itself. We don't want to alter this original image. So I'm going to create a layer right on top of that. And we'll say this is um, forest shadows. So I'm going to paint darker colors. See, it's all very light back here. But let me grab one of the darker kind of colors. So I'm going to paint just a little over the top of these 
nearest trees and then I'll change that to multiply and turn down the opacity a bit just to kind of create shape where I don't have enough yet so we'll do multiply turn that down and actually I really should be using an airbrush for that. Okay. since everything else is on top of these we don't have to really make this a clipping mask but if you wanted to you could make it a clipping mask also means that this uh, structure, right, this entire hillside, would start casting a shadow on the forest itself. So past around this point, we want to create a much larger mass, which is going to ca uh, cast a shadow up the hillside itself. And eventually the castle would do the same thing. So I'm going to just put um, a significant area here in shadow. Try to respect the fact that there are trees poking up and down. So it would make this a little bit of a rougher shape and just kind of cast this shadow back in this way vaguely and then I could fine-tune it once I know exactly the shapes I'm going to want so there we go let's turn that down a little bit let's zoom out yeah so we've got a shadow casting from the rocky shape back into that area there um, we've got little bits of shadow on these near trees we don't have to keep going too much on this, but I just wanted to give an example of how to kind of integrate these things nicely. Uh, one last thing I will do though on this layer is sort of repair the edges of these trees up here because they've sometimes got sky showing through. So I'll grab one of the green colors and just kind of paint. Oh, this is a multiply layer, so I don't want that. Let's do one more and make this a part of the clipping mask. So this would be, um, so rock shadows and this one will be um, color edges okay so I'm just painting right over these bits that way I can sort of mask them out any way I want and I'll always get kind of a valid tree shape Whoop, back here I want to use the darker colors okay don't want it to really be the same ever okay and over here I can use these rock colors just to cover up any tiny errors that I don't want to have haunting me and so right here let's do standard marker but I'm going to turn down the hardness a bit so if I come up here now and I start just oops, where am I on? oh I was on the wrong color and I just want to cut out a little bit more tree shaped details it's gonna look a lot more natural when we zoom out I did say I wasn't gonna do a lot of detail up here on the top because we're gonna cover over it but this did make a good example so I wanted to very quickly show that in our case though I'm about to put a castle on top of this so it's not gonna make much difference maybe down on these lowest ones it does all right so anyway there we go so we've got this kind of integrated I still don't quite like the color of this lowest bit of green but we can deal with that later I'm gonna save because that was one whole step and now let's put the castle on top if you want to be able to collapse this by the way in your layers palette we could put all of this inside of a group like this Sometimes it will get rid of your clipping mask if you do that. Just grab all these and set them to a clipping mask again. I'm going to name this as Rock. Save one more time. And so if I want to have an easier to navigate uh, layer stack, then I could just collapse those. Okay, castle then. <clears throat> so we've got this nice outcropping here. It's a lot sharper than the rock, so unfortunately there's a little incongruity there. Uh, but I want to color adjust this and uh, do a little bit of intensity adjustment as well. So I'm going to look at the part of the image that uh, is relevant to us. Put in a uh, adjustment layer for color balance. And let's see, I think that the, you know what, I'm going to do the, uh, the curves first because I can't tell. So I'll do a curves. Make sure they're both clipping masks otherwise they will affect everything else in the scene so this was definitely a little bit too bright overall so just taking that center part of that curve and bringing it down a little bit is going to help 
uh, particularly on the lightest light colors. Um, I think they are the ones that I'm seeing blowing out just a little bit too much. So there we go, just bringing that down a bit. And then the darker tones, they really only start matching once I drag them down a little bit further. I think that's a bit better. If I go too far, then it's going to be hard to blend them in. So I'm just going to leave them right about there. See the middle tones. I think the middle tones can be right about here. And that should be fine. OK, so now I'll do the color. The color actually is pretty good now that I've done the, the curves. It doesn't look like it needs a whole lot of adjustment. Let's try to see what about the shadows. If the shadows are more blue, more magenta, what about more red? No. So there's too cold, too warm. Leave that in the middle. I think just a little bit of magenta and a little bit of blue in the shadows. Feels like it tied it together nicely. Midtones. I feel like the midtones need nothing. I don't see any any strong color difference in the midtones. How about the highlights then? No. I think it was just the shadows. Yeah, everything I do except for the shadows is making it look worse. Maybe slightly redder in the highlight colors. Okay, so I'm going to reset these to zero and in the midtones to zero because they didn't need anything. Just the shadows and the highlights just a tiny bit. Let's see without. Yeah, that helped. Okay, yeah, both of those adjustments helped. Notice that all of these, though, they have their own layer masks. So if you wanted to stop affecting part of this image from the color adjustment or the intensity adjustment, you could paint black on this layer mask and it would prevent that. Let's see that real quick. I'll paint over the top tower with black just to show that we can do that. So you can kind of subtly see the color adjusting there. And I'll do the same thing on the curves. You can see all of those adjustments that we just made no longer apply to this tower, which makes it stick out, unfortunately, because the color adjustment was a good thing. So I'm going to just fill in white for that whole region again. So we're back to that same adjustment. This can be helpful if you're doing like creatures or people and you want to adjust like skin color, but not the color of their teeth or their eyes or something like that. Okay. Let's try to merge the bottom of this castle in. So now I'm going to try to definitely remove this hard line, but be careful about how much I remove because a blending of these things is good. Like So here I just cut a hole in the side of this, which I um, don't want to have happen. So I'm going to fill this back in, moving down there. But then at some point, I kind of just want it to fade into this darker shape. Right? It's okay if those two things fade together. So black color, cut this out right, just like that. They kind of fade together nicely. And we want to remove small bits of it and just kind of try to make it look natural. So sometimes it's going to be a bit hard, especially these two images have very, very different resolutions. So up close like this, it looks awful. So I should probably just zoom out a bit and do my adjustments way back here. So softer brushes sometimes, more chaotic brush strokes sometimes. And that's going to help you to kind of integrate the two things together a bit better. Sometimes you're going to want the uh, back layer to show, sometimes the front layer, depending on what you're removing or what you're adding. Okay, so this part particularly, I think that was actually a tree back there. Okay. So something like that. And I think I'm going to go back to my uh, mountain and I'm going to remove that 
tree just because it's very distracting. And in fact, let's shrink this tree a bit too. So now it just kind of all blends together a bit better. There we go. Just don't want to focus on that sort of edge. Okay. So blurry though it is, we kind of have a, a natural transition from one to the other. I think that if this was quite small, you probably wouldn't be able to notice that transition very easily. Um, I may have to draw extra shadows on the rock surface, but I don't really think in this case that's necessary, or additional shadows on the hillside, which now this is a very, very tall tower, which would cast a very long shadow, and so I'd probably want to do that. I don't really know what color I was using um, to do that original shadow, but as long as it's dark, it's fine. And I'm just going to keep that going out in this direction. Okay. A little bit like that. And so now I've got a fairly long shadow casting somewhere out there. Fortunately, with trees, they're fuzzy enough that we can't really see the difference. So there we go. We've got this castle placed in the scene. Uh, so some things that you may have to do uh, once you get several things in at once, you may have to do color washes over it or you may have to um, blur the elements a little bit. With concept art it's okay if we know that that was copy pasted in the scene, it's not really a big deal. But some parts of this are standing out really badly because this castle is such a, a sharp image compared to everything else. Now we can't really blur this. Um, let's see what happens if I try. Filter blur, we'll do just a Gaussian blur with our preview. Okay, so this is gonna degrade this quality a little bit um, and kind of match it to the rest. You can see now it matches at least this hillside a bit more. Let's turn it down just a bit from there. Okay, it's just removing some of the details. So what we end up getting is a smart filter. And this is just like these adjustment layers down here. This smart filter can be turned on and off. It's just an additional layer. And so if there are parts of this that need to be blurrier, say the bottoms down here, then we could allow this filter to take effect. And if we wanted to remove the blur effect from higher up, then we can just paint black over that layer mask. And now those upper reaches of the tower are less blurry. Uh, in this case though, I think leaving it blurrier makes it all fit together a bit better because it was standing out too much before. Um, same thing with color adjustments, like down here on this grassy portion uh, of the castle, or the hillside rather. Here are the color adjustments we did. They were just for the rock face, but this green is uh, very, very apparent. So I'm gonna do one more color adjustment. So we'll do a color balance here. Uh, it's already a clipping mask, so that's good. I'm gonna fill it with, uh, black though. So I'm going to select all and control backspace. And then I'm going to paint white on that little hillside. We can't see anything yet because I haven't changed the colors, but as soon as I do, there we go. So we're going to take the red, take the green out of that and make it a lot more yellowish about highlight colors. We don't want to go too far, but this does make it easy to see what it is I'm masking. I'm masking that whole region right there. Um, so if I wanted to do any little adjustments then I could, let's just say I'll do it for a few of the little grassy points on the hill as well. And just make sure I go nice and far down into this forested area. Uh, and I'll remove it from the trees just a little bit. Okay, so that's the, the region I'm adjusting. So let me turn this back to a reasonable amount. Not sure which direction to go here. Let's try shadows. Definitely not that direction. Yeah, sort of into this purplish and red direction seems to be helping. And I could also do an intensity adjustment right on that one hillside if I wanted to, to help it blend in it's a bit conspicuous, but really that hillside looked ridiculous either way. And so it helped a little bit. I probably went too red. 
or two purple. Or it's possible it just needs its own curves adjustment as well. Anyway, I think you get the idea that we can do lots and lots of adjustments, treat each of these as sort of a puzzle piece to put in our scene and assemble things together. Uh, one of the really cool things about using this uh, non-destructive process is that if I put everything into a group, let's go ahead and put the castle into its own group. Now I can turn the castle on and off in its entirety if I want to. Let's put the um, forest shadows and the castle and the rock into a group. And we'll just say this is um, everything. If I did a really good job, I may be able to just move this around the scene to place this somewhere else. Did I? Yeah. Let's see. Here we go. So I've got this kind of island of um, rock that can grow out of some position with a shadow being cast. A lot of the edits towards the bottom were specifically made for the place that I put it, but if I stop dragging it for a second, you can see it doesn't really look so out of place there either. Uh, or I could duplicate this a few times if I wanted several different um, similar size castles. Smart filters applied to layers containing this group will be turned off temporarily while the transform is being previewed. Okay, because so I tried to scale this just now. That's fine. So we could put this further back into the scene like that, or we could duplicate it several different times. Eventually, this is going to bloat your um, Photoshop file and make it very, very large. But there we go. So it's placed back. If I undo, let's undo again. I brought it all back to the original position. So I could duplicate this whole group, everything, and everything copy. <laughs> let's take that. Um, I'm going to put it beneath. There we go. A little second tower there. Say, okay, that's fine. Shrink it. Let's try putting it back there somewhere, just for the sake of trying something. So, see, it looks a bit weird way, way back there because of the um, atmospheric effect that's taking place on these hills. We've got this mist as well as just kind of this distance. There's also some sort of visible square. On one of these layers there was something that I didn't mask out in its entirety. Looks like it's in the castle. Probably the castle mask layer itself is what I would guess. So just very quickly I'm going to take a black... yeah there it is. For some reason the very edges of a object don't always remove even if you do a select all kind of thing. So way back here obviously I need to trim down the shadows a bit and I could either just delete them or mask them. Okay. But really I need one big adjustment over this whole thing to kind of make it more light and sky colored and reduce the amount of contrast. So what I can do is I'm going to do an adjustment layer. Let's just do curves and I'm going to make it a clipping mask of the entire group. Uh, it needs to be up here. There we go. Clipping mask? Oh, it won't let me. I think that this is possible, but I have to make this group into its own smart object in order to do it. So you can see that the option is grayed out. Uh, let me go ahead and do that. So I'm going to convert this to a smart object. That just means that if I want to edit anything in this group, I have to double click it to open it as its own entire composition. Save it, and it saves as a PSB, right? Save it and close. And when you come back here, all the changes will have been made. So now I should be able to treat it as a object, which I can make a clipping mask. So let's lighten everything a little bit, and I think, which way? I think it's this way. There we go. I want the shadows to output as grayer. So dragging this upward now. Let's try just dragging that upward. There we go. That's helping a bit. And this one? No. I mean, that does take out the contrast a little bit. So I'm lowering the contrast overall by doing that. 
Okay, or I could paint some mist over the top of this. So I think something like that. And then, yeah, we're basically good at that point. It looks like it's farther away, has a lower contrast now. So hopefully that was helpful and you guys could throw together your own compositions and scenes. Just know that this is oftentimes um, what I just demonstrated, a lot more effort than you should put in if you're going to use it as a base for painting. If you're going to use it for a base for painting, just throw the objects in, scale them, mask them a little, and then paint right over the top of it like it's your underlayer. Um, that's pretty much what you should do. But if you're going to actually photo edit a scene together, then this would be the way to do it. Probably want to spend a lot more time being careful um, than I was being. All right. Hopefully that was helpful to you guys.